Celebrating 44 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a step back in time with the opening of a small grocery store in the Mississippi Delta. Plus, the president proposes a massive spending project, trillions to be spent on infrastructure. In Southern Gardening, Gary says it's easier than you think to grow your landscape in containers. And an encore presentation with implications for the future. Voices from the Flood. Farm Week starts right now. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. Last week, Joe Biden offered up his rather large spending plan, his idea for retooling the nation by proposing big, big projects and hyping the number of jobs needed to make those projects a reality. As you've probably heard, though, the plan was met with opposition. It's big, yes. It's bold, yes. And we can get it done. Last week, the president traveled to Pennsylvania to promote his American jobs plan. It's a once-in-a-generation investment in America, unlike anything we've seen or done since we built the interstate highway system and the space race decades ago. In a nothings-off-the-table approach, the president's broad proposal covers a variety of projects. He believes spending $600 billion on highway, bridge, and road improvements, another $100 billion on nationwide broadband expansion, and $100 billion more on green energy upgrades to the power grid will make the nation more competitive on the global stage. His administration plans to pay for the eight-year $2.3 trillion spending package by raising taxes on corporations and closing tax loopholes. In late March, new Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg appeared before the House Transportation Committee to lay out Biden's priorities. We see other countries pulling ahead of us with consequences for strategic and economic competition. By some measures, China spends more on infrastructure every year than the U.S. and Europe combined. The infrastructure status quo is a threat to our collective future. But conservatives are critical of both the scope and the cost of the project, saying the package could balloon even more with unrelated spending. You know, after providing unprecedented levels of COVID-related relief this past year, we need to carefully consider what goes into um, a transportation package. The more massive any bill becomes, the more, you know, bipartisanship suffers. Of course, the president hopes his plan will boost the economy and make a dent in poverty, especially where food insecurity is concerned. With that in mind, we met with a group of people in Mississippi committed to increasing food accessibility in one of the poorest states in the nation. Here with more is Farm Week's Jonah Holland. Mike, it's no coincidence that we spend a fair amount of time on Farm Week talking about food insecurity, especially over the last year. Food deserts, areas with limited access to affordable and nutritious food, are just about everywhere. But in the Mississippi Delta, one small town, a step further from that kind of fragile food environment, thanks to the opening of its first grocery store in years. I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. It's, I'm just very grateful, very thankful that we made it to this point. I've been fighting back tears all morning. And with those words, Velma Wilson, born and raised in the small town of Marks, Mississippi, helped usher in a new era, one with a grocery store, something not available in this Delta town for several years. After three years of effort, and with the help of Mississippi State University Extension, the elbow grease of elected leaders, project managers, and with a donated building, Marks residents can once again shop in their own store, avoiding a longer drive elsewhere in the Delta. We've had to travel at least 20 miles either direction towards Clark Cellar Batesville or even further to Memphis to grocery shop. Our seniors have to pay people to take them to the grocery store, which is terrible. But having a local store where even if you're just going to pick up necessities is absolutely 
wonderful. So it's been almost four years since there's been no grocery store here. So I work with the Board of Supervisors, the County Board of Supervisors, and also we collaborated with the City of Marks to try to find uh, an owner, someone to come here and to operate the store. And then the financing was one of the things that I worked with the boards on, getting the financing. We got some bond money from the state and we got a grant from the Healthy Food Finance Initiative in order to put this together and make it work. At one point, Marks, Mississippi was the poorest town in the poorest county in the poorest state in America. These days, it's not that anymore, although many in the community still struggle. Those who make this grocery store possible want to help make sure that that struggle is just a little bit easier. People here are used to going to Batesville, which is about 20 miles down the road one way, and just the opposite way is Clarksdale, about 20 miles, and they're used to going there because they hadn't had a grocery store here in so long. Of course, people are creatures of habit. If we can get them not, so they're not used to going out of town to buy their groceries and they buy it from me, well, it would be a great situation for everybody. Marks has been needing one of these for years. And this has been the best one that's been here in a long years. Marsh used to have a lot of grocery stores. I mean, there was a lot of people in the town and the county. There's more to the story, though. This Marks event transcends the boundaries of time and the weight of history. You see, it was in Marks, more than half a century ago, that Martin Luther King Jr. spoke the very place he wanted his Poor People's Campaign to start in 1968. Velma Wilson was there when he visited as just a teenager. I think that's one of the reasons why I came back uh, after being gone for almost 50 years from this community. And I just felt like, uh, you know, he had a dream of, of, of rising, you know, getting people out of poverty. I, will, I would love to be the, the dream he had and to do my part. Uh, and so this is my community. I was born and raised here. So it's a blessing to be back. And I consider it more mission work than anything else. And so the town of Marks moves on with wide-ranging help. Quitman County is still struggling. Government data indicate that about one-third of its citizens are in poverty. Still with improved access to food and a collective focus on solving nutritional challenges, those citizens are better equipped to meet the future. Mike? Thanks, Jonah. One of the phrases we use frequently in the television world is, it's in the can when we're finished with an upcoming story. But in the gardening world, in the can is something altogether different. And it's something you can do quite easily. Here's Gary Bachman to sort it all out. committed container grower and almost everything in my home garden is grown in some kind of container. I believe that there are advantages that are beneficial to the home garden. There are different containers to use in the garden. Conventional containers are watered from the top and have drain holes around the bottom. Sub-irrigation containers offer the advantage of a water reservoir that allows the plant to water itself. A product that I've recently become aware of is called a grow bucket, and it converts a five-gallon bucket into a sub-irrigated container. You simply put the pieces together, drop it in the bucket, and you're ready to start growing. But my go-to container, which I've shared many times, is the earth box. This is the workhorse of my home garden, and here I'm growing wheat. To enjoy the best container results, I always recommend growing in a soilless container mix. The primary ingredients are peat moss, bark, perlite, and or vermiculite. They are engineered with varying particle sizes to be light and airy and to drain very well. These container mixes are readily available at your local garden center and come in a variety of bag sizes. Many commercial container potting mixes have some fertilizer mixed in, which is beneficial in getting plants off to a good start. But I always advise using supplemental controlled release fertilizer. Container gardening is highly scalable. You can start with one or two pots and then grow an entire yard. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and we'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break here, but don't go away. Coming up in 2019, Mississippi's Lower Delta experienced an unprecedented backwater flood. 
Many of the residents who struggled through the seven months of flooding felt the disaster could have been prevented. Coming up, an encore presentation of part one of our five-part series examining what happened. We'll hear from some of those who lived through that catastrophe. Stay with us for Voices from the Flood, coming up on Farmer. Don't go away. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. ATVs are a ton of fun for people of all ages, but these powerful machines can also be a ton of trouble if safety guidelines aren't followed. Never carry more than one person on a single rider four-wheeler. The four-wheeler can become unstable and very dangerous. ATVs are designed for off-road use only. Never drive one on a highway or any other paved surface. And always ride the right size machine at the right speed. This message brought to you by MSU Extension 4-H. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea, extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Time once again for the Market Report. Zach Ashmore here to clue us all in. Zach? Thanks, Mike. Markets looking a bit up last week. Once again, livestock rising while row crops a mixed bag. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, wheat dropping four cents, a trend the past several weeks, and we've talked about it. Looks like good stock and price competition, the big factor there. Last week's biggest gain, lumber jumping up 60 bucks this time, and once again livestock, namely lean hogs and live cattle rising, albeit less than last week. Last week we said row crop prices affected by an upcoming USDA report, specifically its grain stocks report released on March 31st. In short, it says, well, stocks are down, corn 3%, soybeans 31%, and wheat 7%. What does that mean? Well, it means the markets for these commodities now bullish. That explains why corn and soybeans are up, but why not wheat? Because the markets had it pegged correctly to begin with. Analyst Arlen Suderman says this is typical for the USDA. Looks like prices will stay high. If you look at the, the error, just uh, this typical error that you might get in doing a survey like this, you can probably fairly much within the range of error, but that has huge price implications, particularly when stocks are tight like they are right now, and especially for soybeans because these numbers essentially mean that unless something happens to demand, uh, and there are some possibilities there, we're gonna be rationing corn and soybean for the next 18 months. Uh, so it is a big deal, and uh, the market certainly reacted that way. Obviously, both corn and soybeans went up the limit, pulled back from that then on Thursday to close out the week. Um, but the implications are the largest for soybeans. On Wednesday, it was all about buy anything and everything because of this bullish report. On Thursday, it became, well, wait a minute, the stocks numbers really weren't bullish for the three commodities, maybe friendly for corn, but it, this was really about a new crop story. So let's buy the new crop and spread it against the old crop. So that really became the story. And if you look at the two days put together, May corn still gained 20 cents on the two days put together, and soybeans still gained 35 cents on the two days put together. And we still had net gains for the week for corn and soybeans for the spot contract. So it's still positive. What I didn't like from a technical standpoint is the lead May contract closed just below some previous levels of resistance on the charts that had been 
holding us for quite a while. And from, if you know, the bulls would certainly like to see us climb back above those levels as we go in the week ahead. As we said, wheat stocks down, yet prices also down. Looks like the market already knew how things looked, but wheat can also be an indicator for other row crops too. Are we gonna see a drop in corn and soybeans in the same way? Once again, Arlen Suderman fills us in. Following the numbers that we got this week, the job of the market is to put more wheat in the feed bunk, and we're certainly doing that. We were expecting to see aggressive feeding of wheat this summer when the feedlots could buy it right out of the field and not have to pay elevator uh, charges. Um, but we started seeing a lot of old crop wheat go in and that simply increased after this week's report. Now, uh, I anticipate we're gonna see a lot more of it. I think this will be a big year for wheat feeding. That's helping offset some of the increased production estimates from the rains that we've been seeing uh, during the month of March in the winter wheat belt. Uh, the, the old adage was oats knows wheat follows and then corn and beans are behind it. I, I think that's less of a factor now because of how integrated our livestock industry is for corn and soybean demand and our biofuels programs. And so they're divorcing corn and soybeans a little bit more from wheat. They're, they're still tied in. Corn is particularly still tied in, um, but corn can also be a leader of wheat. And so it's not just wheat leading corn anymore like it once was. We've regularly talked about the up and down of timber prices this past year. We've seen massive fluctuations. And as we've said, much of that has to do with COVID and its effects on the industry. But there's more to that. And I took a deeper look to understand seasonal price volatility. Here's what I found. According to Forest to Market, timber price volatility is affected mostly by five factors. Competition, inventory, track size, tree size, and quality, and seasonality. In the case of lumber down south, especially this time of year, seasonality is the biggest, aka weather. Wet weather prevents harvesting, which means less timber despite plenty in the ground. That drives prices up. Also, this time of year is a transition period where buyers are looking at areas to harvest this summer. They also take into account the possibility of continuing wet weather like we had a few years back. That means demand's still high, which causes prices to rise. Finally, we take into account building season when lumber demand is at its peak, but builders are already looking to collect materials for that season when it hits. So, that's a small part of why we still see high lumber prices even in winter. As with all commodities, it's about supply and demand. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Planting season getting underway and stocks looking precarious. Let's hope for good weather this year to make it up. Higher prices might be good for traders, but it does affect the consumer as well. Mike? Thanks, Zach. We showed you this story in August, and we're going to show you again. It's a story difficult to watch. If you live in Mississippi, you know all about it. If you don't, you may be surprised, mostly because it did not get a lot of attention in the national media. In 2019, well over half a million acres flooded in Mississippi's lower delta. It was a combination of relentless rain in the region and epic runoff from higher up in the nation. But there's much more to the story and those who came through the catastrophe, many of whom lost their homes and everything in them, believe it could have been prevented. So today, once again, with their help, we bring you Voices from the Flood. It hurts to see everybody misplaced and out of place. My mom's out of place, my brother's out of place. All my friends and other family members are out of place. It's just, I never seen nothing like that before in my life. Some people just didn't have much. They just didn't have much to start with. They didn't have flood insurance and they can't get flood insurance and they lost everything. It was the flood that never ended. 2019, the perfect storm that put 550,000 acres of the Mississippi Delta underwater. But it's actually a complicated story. The federal government long ago recognized that because the Mississippi River drains 31 states, it was in the country's best interest to develop a massive flood control system, which it did. Basically, one of those pieces is near the south end of the Delta, from Vicksburg North, east of the Mississippi River, and west of the Yazoo River. That land is the Yazoo Backwater Area, a 1,550-square-mile arrowhead of land that forms what some call a bathtub. 
At a drainage structure like this one, Steel Bayou, water in that backwater bathtub is released to the Yazoo River, which empties into the Mississippi. And it works just fine most of the time, unless the Mississippi is higher. That forces the Steel Bayou gates closed and keeps the water in the bathtub. That's when pumps become necessary, and they were authorized as part of the long-term Yazoo Backwater Area Project. But toward the end, after everything else had been built, the door would be closed on that most essential part of the system, the pumps. None of this had to happen. And all retired to Eagle Lake, in the flood zone not far from Steel Bayou in 2018. Some of her property was destroyed in the flood. She's been blogging about it since, spearheading a grassroots effort to get the pumps installed. The pumps were started, you know, literally back in the 80s. They got caught up in a cost-sharing uh, law that had been enacted that took us 10 years to prove that we should be grandfathered into that. So we fought that for 10 years. And it was seven years of the Corps of Engineers going through new studies because so much time has passed. And by that time, the EPA and the environmentalist groups had kind of come into power, if you will, and ended up um, vetoing us building the pumps. So, with the Mississippi River high like it was in 2019 and no way to open the steel bayou gates or pump the water out of the South Delta, it piled up. Why did the EPA veto the pumps, though there are 22 similar systems along the Mississippi River? It turns out that a number of environmental groups objected, saying that numerous animal habitats would be harmed. And they said there would be problems downstream, though the Corps of Engineers ultimately proved otherwise. And there were economic objections, too. Some opponents felt the $220 million price tag would be too high. And of all the projects that are done in all the states of this same type, this is the only project that the pumps were not installed. Everybody else that has this has the pumps. Uh, just across the Mississippi River in Louisiana, their elevation is lower than ours. So they should have had flooding more, but they have the same system with the pumps. So the pumps keep it pumped out. There's no question that the 2019 backwater flood was a disaster. Just under half of the 550,000 acres that were flooded were cropland. The Mississippi Levee Board says nothing was planted on those acres. Meanwhile, 686 homes were flooded, several highways were overtopped, and wildlife was decimated. On June 13th of 2019, the Levee Board says two people drowned trying to turn around near Holly Bluff. Had the pumps been in place, it says, at least 109,000 acres of cropland would have been spared. No highways would have been overtopped, no homes flooded. It wasn't a, a flood like you sometimes see or mo probably more often than not see on television where, you know, something came up and flooded. There was a big storm or, or something like that, you know, some sort of real natural disaster. This, to us, this is a man-made disaster because the project was put in to bring all the water to the South Delta and block it. Part of the project was to put pumps in to get it out, and it never happened. Not debating who was right or who was wrong or what decisions were made right or wrong. Uh, where we are now is we need the pumps. We need the uh, uh, EPA, uh, the Corps of Engineers, and all to get on board and get this project finished. It was funded. It was complete. It was designed. It just wasn't installed. When water gets behind gates that are closed, levee says they pump it out, pump it into the Mississippi River. These pumps right here on the Yazoo backwater area are the only pumps that have not been placed. Despite the enormity of the flooding, the Yazoo backwater disaster received almost no national attention. We asked residents what they wanted the world to know. That it was man-made that it didn't have to happen. Basically, the, my little lesson from all this, personally, and the way I feel is, it might be bad, but we're gonna get through it. Some way, somehow, we're gonna get through it. And we did. Are we gonna have to go through it again? I don't know. If they put those pumps in, 
I mean, our community will be a lot better. And most people, I believe, will come back and go back home. I myself, if they gonna put the pumps in, I would like to go home and build me a nice house there. But they really need to put the pumps in. We, know, we need those pumps. Since that story aired, the Army Corps of Engineers has signed off on a plan to finish the pumps. Environmental groups have sued, again, and there may be some fallout from that. No physical work has been done, but plans are still in progress. And Dahl, featured in that piece you just saw, told me she thinks finishing the pumps will turn into a marathon. We'll continue to follow the story. Well, next time on Farm Week, a career in agriculture. It's not just about riding a tractor or feeding the livestock. There is, of course, a heck of a lot more to it. As we all know, variables are everywhere, and so's the uncertainty. Loss could come from almost anywhere. And that's what these students are learning in one of the most sophisticated college curricula in the nation. Managing risk, it's the art of the hedge, next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.